Most people call chrysanthemums a mum. It's a pretty complex hybrid. Um, the chrysanthemum, its lineage goes back to China, whereas the uh, carnation is, is the Mediterranean. This is from China. And we typically have two different um, uh, species uh, that, 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 this, that they've come from. The yellow types are from the chrysanthemum indicum, and the rose and lilac colors and the others are chrysanthemum morifolium. <laughs> the British and the Dutch, they started hybridizing mums in about the 1840s, and in the United States, Elmer Smith, another gardener nurseryman on the East Coast, started around 1889. And most of the hybridization, most of the work on chrysanthemums, and there's still quite a bit of chrysanthemum hybridization going on today. In fact, uh, most of the mum hybridization is going on in the United States today happens at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and um, where he's primarily looking at garden varieties, but they're also looking at year-round forcing, uh, dealing with cool temperatures, and looking for post-harvest quality. Now the early classification of the modern chrysanthemum uses the, the name chrysanthemum morifolium. However, you'll see in the, uh, there was a period of time where they switched the nomenclature to dendranthemum grandiflorum. I think the nomenclature's gone back again now to chrysanthemum morifolium. You'll see it both ways in the literature. And for those of you taking herbaceous plant materials, whatever Dr. Klett says is what you're gonna use. What's he teaching? you had chrysanthemums yet in herbaceous plants? You don't remember? Okay. What's the significance? The significance is they can't ever make up their mind. Um, now chrysanthemum is in the Asteraceae family. Some people call it the Compositae family. Uh, but it's a composite inflorescence. And the flower itself is very minor. It's the flower head, however, is on a, a flower organ that we call a capitulum or receptacle, where we have a whole host of flowers and on a cymos cluster, or cyme is the cluster that holds the composite flower. Okay? So we have a receptacle and we have outer flowers on the edge are called ray flowers, and the inner flowers are called disc flowers. And the composite inflorescence um, on our capitulum, um, the outer rows, the ray flowers, are pistillate, okay, the, and that's basically holding most of the um, female parts whereas the inner flower, the disc flowers, are bisexual or primarily uh, staminate and in the inner part. And those are those called the disc flowers. So we have ray flowers and disc flowers. Think of the disc as the middle of the bloom and the ray is on the outside of the bloom. Which leads to lots of different infl of inflorescence types. The single is what we typically call a daisy, a daisy-like mum, a daisy mum, where we only have one or two rows of ray flowers, as you can see with the white petals, and where we have a tight, uh, compact grouping of the disc flowers, which is the yellow part of the bloom. So we actually have several hundred flowers in that one inflorescence. Anemones. Anemone flowers are similar to the singles. The disc flowers, however, are elongated, forming more of a cushion. And you'll hear the word cushion mum sometimes. Um, and a lot of times the disc flowers actually are different colors to give us a little bit of an in interest and intensity. Um, so the disc, the disc flowers might be a different color than the ray flowers. Pom-poms or buttons, uh, they're globular. We have short uniform rays. These are considered to be formal. Oftentimes, uh, the pom-poms will be grown as a large single inflorescence that are disbudded. And uh, some universities actually use pom-poms as a, for a homecoming mum, this big gaudy flower that 
pins on some young lady's beautiful blouse and it just stretches it all out. I'm going, why would you do that? Um, but there's also the little tiny ones too. So the pom-poms, uh, short uniform rays. Um, these are for more formal, traditional arrangements. The decoratives have mostly ray flowers, very few of the disc flowers, and the outer rows are, lower, are longer, and they're what we call more informal because we have lots of different petal links. Spiders, or some people call them Fujis, um, have very long, um, the disc flowers, you can't even hardly see them, so they're, they're in here, but the ray flowers are very long uh, and uh, feathery like a, like, like a spider. Um, we typically see these in, in oriental arrangements. Another type of inflorescence, we call it a spoon type, where the ends of the um, ray flowers actually flatten out, open up like a spoon. They look like a little tiny spoon that you might use to dip salt. Quills is the, the petals are very tightly rolled and actually look like a porcupine quill, very long and, and sharp. So these are the different kinds of petal types that you'll have. So we typically grow mums uh, two different ways, cut mums. We use what's called a disbudded inflorescence or a spray inflorescence. Now remember the cluster of receptacles or the cluster of flowers that we have is born on a structure called a cyme, okay? And uh, um, we have cymes and racemes and corem and these and umbels and different flower structures that you've all learned in your plant ID class, correct? Okay. That class is so hard. So you have your disbudded inflorescence. What we're doing is we take out the terminal bud. Uh, the disbud, we take all the flower buds out except for the terminals. And you see here's the, the largest one is the terminal. And in a cymose cluster, the, the first one blooms first, then this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. So we want to take these out. By taking out these lower lateral buds and leaving only one, we're going to make that one flower large. Put all the energy of the plant in the, into that particular bud. Spray inflorescence where we want the entire cyme, all the flowers of the cyme to bloom at the same time. If we let it just go naturally, they bloom in a pattern. We're going to take this largest bud out and the lateral buds then will develop. And actually this is a picture of this particular bud. The top picture is the inflorescence without any uh, disbudding. The lower picture is where we've actually removed the lateral buds for the spray type, we, we do the exact opposite. Mums are propagated uh, from cuttings. Uh, we take them from terminal tip cuttings. Uh, a grower that grows uh, mum cuttings um, maintains a stock block. We want them three to four inches long. They root really easy with uh, just plain old rooting powder or rooting hormone. They need a porous, well-drained mix. A little bit of calcium in the soil always helps. The greenhouse temperature needs to be 60 to 65. Rooting temperature is 65 to 70. That's the temperature of the soil. Again, chrysanthemums like to have warm soil. Use intermittent mist, and we use an elongated day or photo period to keep the plants vegetative. Because if the day length isn't long, and this is a picture of a mum uh, propagation facility outside of Alva, Florida, and the stock plants are grown directly in the bed. They'll harvest those. We have the lamps for extended photo period. Um, this is plastic sheeting that's drug over the beds uh, that's injected with methyl bromide to sanitize the soil. Most growers will harvest, bring in rooted cuttings from commercial propagators just because you don't want it. That way, if you're buying in rooted cuttings, you don't have to have uh, propagation facilities. You can get index cuttings, your uniform. And by bringing in rooted cuttings from somebody else, you can get uh, 
a more variety material. Mums will grow in just about anything. As long as the soil is pathogen free, um, either with steam heat or with uh, verticillium for methyl bromide control. Um, if you're doing field production of chrysanthemums, which some a lot of people do in the United States still, uh, they'll, they'll till in their um, plant debris, but it's got to be pasteurized. You want to avoid oversteaming a heavy soil though, because they'll build up a lot of manganese and iron and primarily ammonium toxicity. pH is a little lower than uh, carnations, 5.5 to 6.5. Mediterranean species typically like carnations, a little more alkaline. Um, the, some of the Chinese product grow, pro crops, a little lower, and relatively low uh, electrical conductivity of less than 2.5 decisiemens per meter. So here's some mum bed production, and this is a, a mum farm outside of um, San Luis Rey, California, which is just north of San Diego, um, where they have gone in and tilled their beds, raised them up, um, and they've got their framework already put in place for their uh, for their netting. Are there mums in the background as well? Um, yeah, those are mums in the background. This is the Milano family farm. Uh, mums grow best with lots of water, but we wanted to let it dry in between irrigation. They don't like wet toes. Uh, irrigate thoroughly. Most people use drip hoses. Uh, we don't use overhead except to cool off the plant or get the plants established. Once the plants are established, and but uh, you sw switch to a drip irrigation or something that just sprays the surface of the soil. We don't want to have a uh, wet water on the flower buds. Um, they'll typically, we'll bloom them, we want to get them height up to about 30 to 36 inches. Here we see newly transplanted um, cuttings. You can see the, the flower netting is already laid down. We lift, lift the mesh up through the crop. Um, these are high tunnels that they'll use. The flower growers have been using high tunnels for decades, long before high tunnels were popular in the vegetable area. And here you see that they've got their photoperiod light strung out. Again, this is at the Milano family farm in San Luis Rey, California. They're heavy feeders. They get hungry real fast. We give them 200 parts per million nitrate and potassium. Nitrate and potassium. Um, the first 80 days of that production, we don't want our plants to go nutrient hungry at all. Last 20 days, only the inflorescence is growing. And in fact, when the inflorescence is really starting to develop, 20 to 25% of the nitrogen is going to be there anyway, and we need to start backing off. In fact, the last two weeks of flower development for chrysanthemums, we don't give them anything. We feed them heavy as they're getting established, but once the bloom starts to develop, we cut them off gives us a better quality flower, okay? Excess nitrogen during the inflorescence stages will have brittle stems, brittle foliage, and the flower quality in the vase life actually declines. So, um, and most growers will use leaf tissue analysis to, to manage their tissue, manage their fertility. We use, um, for our plant spacing, um, we'll do what's called a soft pinch as soon as the roots start to form. And that soft pinch uh, stimulates lateral branching. Um, in the summertime, we space them six to seven inches, six by seven. Uh, in the wintertime, we give them seven to eight, just so we get more light into the, into the canopy. And uh, where we have interior beds, uh, we're going to prune those to two stems. Where the outer bit, outer rows, we pr prune those to three stems per plant. Again, the inner beds get less light because of shading, so we we only allow two stems per plant per plant, and we try to get them. Uh, we maintain a day length of 14 and a half hours, and um, 
using night break so that we get two to four nodes per week for vegetative development. During the winter months when the greenhouses are tight, uh, the plants will, be, will benefit from adding CO2 to the atmosphere. They're not quite as drastic as carnations, but mums will respond to increased CO2 levels as well. All of our hybrid cultivars are short day plants. If you look in the catalogs for buying uh, mum cuttings, you'll see that they, they're classified as response groups. Now, response groups are typically, there's six week cultivars, 15 week cultivars, eight and 11s. What that refers to is the number of weeks from flower initiation to anthesis. And that's what we talk about when we talk about response groups. And we'll talk about response groups and poinsettias as well. It's from flower initiation to anthesis. So the longer response groups actually cost more to grow because they sit on your bench longer. Okay, we want to have shorter response groups because we want to turn that flower faster. So a lot of our growers go to the sh shorter response groups to turn their crop faster. Ben. Do those longer response groups command higher market value at all? Or? Some of them do command a higher market value. Some of them, if you have a specific market that you're targeting for, maybe a specific wedding industry or a specific florist that wants to, a particular color. Uh, if you're looking for those orange mums for uh, Thanksgiving or something like that, uh, some of those are, are, are more um, specialized. And there you're looking for a higher market value and you're gonna be able to command a higher market value, so you would choose that response group regardless of how long it's gonna sit on the bench. But you're gonna transfer that cost to your end user. end user. So we wanna use night lighting or extended photo period for vegetative growth. Uh, a lot of growers will use HID lights, um, you need 500 to 700 foot candles, long days, uh, incandescent, uh, works just as well. We're looking at a, a, about one and a quarter watts per square foot. So 10 foot candles over the fl fl flower bed is just fine. That's not a lot of light. And that's a 60 watt bulb spaced four feet apart, hung two to three feet over the crop. These are uh, 150 watt bulbs that are hung and that's about 18 foot over the crop. When your plant gets to the length of that you want to harvest it at, about 14 to 20 inches, that's when we start the short day cycles. And in the winter months, of course, it's natural. If you want to bloom in the summer months, you have to use black cloth. You need to have at least 12 hours of darkness. Um, you want to do your night, uh, break at, at a certain time of day when you can avoid heat, high temperature under that black cloth, which is difficult to do. Um, 85 degrees, you're going to get a weak heat delay. And you have to have 21 to 28 consecutive days uh, depending on your response group to get that bloom out. 60 degrees flower initiation <coughs> takes 14 and a half hours. Flower development is at 13 and a half hours. So this is the dark period. So flower bud development is different than flower initiation. Um, and of course, we talked about response groups already. And almost all of our timing is based on at 60 degree night temperature. So some of the older cultivars, uh, you can look at your response groups and see where the flower initiation photo period falls. And in the catalogs and the, the distributors, We'll give this information to you based upon the breeding, but these are just some generals, generalization based upon response groups. And these are some old cultivars. Uh, I've grown Encore quite a bit. It's a pretty easy crop to grow. High night temperatures, of course, will delay it. Low temperatures will delay initiation. Um, and again, it's all dependent upon the cultivar. We have um, temperature categories, thermo zero, flower best between 50 and 80. 
uh, thermopositive, have to have a night temperature a minimum of 60. Thermonegative, um, they will not flower at all. And this, all, basically, what you have to, to do when you're choosing your varieties is understand the genetics of the cultivars you're ordering. There are hundreds of mum cultivars out there, literally hundreds of them, but you need to understand the thermopositive, thermonegative. Uh, Most people try to buy the thermo zeros because they have the less complication. And the same, we, we talk about this with cut mums right now. When we talk about pot mums, the same thing is in place. So we won't cover this twice. Rooted cuttings, we pinch after two weeks after transplant. I typically like to hold off my pinching until the roots have extended the length of the cutting away from the stem. That's my rule of thumb, okay? Where did I get that rule of thumb? Experience. So I want those cuttings to extend, I want the roots to be the, so if you were to cut, if it was to fall over, if it's a sick, I want that root to be out, because it's gonna go lateral to begin with. Question? Okay. Um, soft pinch um, induces branching. Uh, we do a tine pinch two weeks after the soft pinch, and what that does is we use that to start shaping our uh, spray. Um, if you do it too early, you run into problems. And we're trying to get a, a spray type thing where we'll develop a crown bud if we pinch it too early and we get erratic blooming. The time pinch, we're getting everything to come on at the same time. If we pinch it too late, the, the um, hormonal activity is already s uh, messed up the apical um, dominance. So uh, by pinching it too early, we create what's called a crown bud and that's a bloom in the middle of the pinch. Time pinch, where you pinch on time, that two week period, you get more uniform development. And there's a better picture of that crown bud. And it's just this tight little flower head that really doesn't go anything. And we get a really erratic development. Sometimes uh, growers, to get elongated peduncles, uh, will um, give 10 consecutive long days after the first 12 short days. And what that does is it lengthens that, that flower stem. So they can, uh, they're looking for a specific flower market, flower stem. They typically do this on standards where they're trying to get a big, huge flower head. Uh, primarily for the hotel market or something like that where they have the large arrangements. Um, you can ex expand your flower out of diameter by after 35 days, we call it after lighting, where you start giving it longer days and what that causes is those, those uh, ray flowers to really elongate. So we're using long days to stimulate gibberellic acid metabolism, which is gonna make that flower head expand. Now that they, all, they don't all work this way, it's mostly the standards. And some people will try to do this with gibberellins or anti-gibberellins to control their stem length. But that's mostly in pot mums. Post-harvest, we want to um, harvest our mum about four inches above the soil line because we want to get away from the woody tissue because the woody tissue does not recut well at the florist does for allowing for water uptake. Uh, a good grower, you know, the first thing they do in, they'll, in the greenhouse uh, as they're harvesting, they will um, automatically hydrate their, their, their flower heads and the flowers should never be packed hot because when they're packed hot and they move to the cooler, they'll get uh, condensation on the petals and you'll have botrytis infection. And we store them uh, 40 to 45 and they're hydrated. If we're gonna not store them hydrated or in buckets, we, we need to get the temperature down as close to freezing as possible. So here's a, a carnation cooling system where the carnations are hydrated, cooled, and packed in these boxes. 
And this is a, uh, the flower boxes have um, holes cut at either end. They're backed up to a plenum. This plenum is uh, their slight vacuum. This is inside of a cooler, walk-in cooler, a large walk-in cooler. And the air comes in through the end of the box, tra flows through the box into the plenum, the vacuum, and then it's circulated back out the top of the plenum. And that's how we maintain that cool temperature to get the field heat off those blooms as fast as possible to eliminate that uh, condensation on the petals. Or if they're stored in a cooler, um, these are mums that are uh, just sitting in, in their own uh, water ready for shipping. Uh, again, this is, a, this is a cooled chamber, a large walk-in cooler for uh, maintaining flowers.